Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Gouman Singh. Happy Monday. Topping our newscast, agricultural economists from around the Caribbean gathered at the Buccaneer Monday. They're here this week for the 31st West Indies Agricultural Economics Conference. This year's focus, climate change and food security. News 2's Erica Parsons has the story. Agricultural economists spent Monday talking about ideas to secure food given the increasing changes with the climate. These are people who look at the numbers, the, all the harvest data. Sometimes I think they're now involved with rainfall data and they have to put all of this together and now be able to come up with projected models, economic models that could help in the worst case scenario of bad climate, extended drought. Islands throughout the Caribbean have been experiencing a drought for months. This conference is a way to share ideas to address future climate challenges. Over the next several days, economists are expected to cover a number of topics from sustainability and environmental impact to the economics of soil conservation. Are we going to be having less yields? And now that if there are communities that are dependent on these commodities, in particular countries and, and island communities that depend at least 70 percent on local production if those numbers drop how do we assist the farming community to get those numbers up what do we need to do as a, a agriculture policy maker local farmers were also present at the conference i'm just here to really see what the, the plan is for the future for farming in the Virgin Islands. University President Dr. David Hall says the area of agriculture should always be a prime focus. No matter what our areas of expertise, no matter where we live, no matter what we do, we are dependent upon food, food production, food safety. And therefore, we need individuals who are dedicated, who are bright, who are committed to exploring this area. Erica Parsons, News 2. We all know that drought conditions locally have been tough on farmers and many have been calling for the administration to declare a drought emergency. Officials have been doing all they can, they say, to assist local farmers, but it turns out that getting that state of emergency might not be so easy. News 2's Erica Parsons has details. Governor Kenneth Mapp and Agriculture Commissioner Carlos Robles are meeting with federal officials about the drought. Later on today, we'll be meeting with the USDA Farm Service Agency Regional Director to have a conversation about the drought declaration, what that process is, uh, do we qualify and what are the next steps. Local farmers have been calling for officials to declare a drought emergency like nearby Puerto Rico, but there's one big reason we can't. Puerto Rico is included in the U.S. drought monitor system. The Virgin Islands have never been included. And that system, when you're a member of it, gives data points which will trigger when an emergency can be declared. That is a shocker to me this morning. And it's a reality also because it's let me know that we are not where we need to be with a lot of things. Just as we monitor for hurricane, we monitor for tsunami, a drought is just as significant because without water, uh, in our society, we cannot survive. Some farmers think more should be done federally. Because the Virgin Islands is not in the U.S. drought monitoring system, there are no data points for which we could access that I would write a or issue a state of emergency that would trigger immediate federal uh, grant dollars. We are going to provide local support dollars. We're going to work with the federal partners to see what additional dollars, including the U.S. Department of Interior, we could bring to the table. Governor Matt plans to approve Senator Jeanette Millen Young's legislation to give agriculture half a million dollars to help with the drought. Mr. Mapp is also submitting a proposal. We're also going to send this week to the legislature our proposal to create the Agriculture Revolving Fund and how we plan to fund it with a minimum of a million dollars each year from a new source of revenue. And then also petition for inclusion in the U.S. drought monitoring system. Erica Parsons, News 2. Now, our neighbor, Puerto Rico, is also in the grip of a drought that is reaching historic proportions. They say the eastern part of the island has now suffered 
through over three months without significant, significant rainfall, and nearly 85 percent of the territory is under a water deficit. USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack signed a secretarial disaster designation on July 15, declaring four primary natural disaster areas. But now, according to the drought monitor, conditions have extended to all or parts of 20 more Municip municipalities. Three USDA agencies joined forces with the PR Department of Agriculture and the PR Economic Development Bank at a meeting to inform farmers of financial assistance and special emergency loans. The Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority's propane project is steadily moving forward, and WABA's executive director, Hugo Hodge, said residents are already feeling the benefits. Late last week, the U.S. Coast Guard gave a good recommendation on an aspect of the project that should help it move forward. This is April Knight has that story. Another step forward for WAPA's propane project. The U.S. Coast Guard told DPNR that it's okay for VTOL Corporation, WAPA's propane project contractor, to transport LPG along specific water routes in the territory. Uh, we, we expected that to come. The approval from, from Coast Guard, we plan to introduce propane to the facility in a couple of weeks, and we should be burning propane next month in St. Croix, maybe two or three months later on St. Thomas. So every, everything's moving well. The waterways would include channels approaching the Wampa Power Plant facilities on St. Thomas and St. Croix. The VTOL ships would take LPG from an ocean vessel further offshore and transport it to the Wampa plants. Their processes are, are well defined. The crews are accountable. Uh, you know, it's just a very, you know, safe and secure uh, process. And the vessels themselves are constructed very, very well. According to the Coast Guard, they did risk assessments and felt it was a secure system. The ship itself would only be 300 feet long and its payload, LPG, while volatile when exposed to oxygen, is practically safe on the transport. You're really not going to notice them to be any different than any of the other ships that come in and out of Charlotte Amalie or uh, into Christianstead. LPG is a cry it's inside the vessel. It's in a cryogenic state. It's a liquid. So it's very safe and stable. According to the Coast Guard, the approvals are an ongoing process. But once approved, you'll be seeing LPG bearing ships along these routes as part of WAPA's regular operations. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. Now, according to the Coast Guard, they did take into account the input from the public that was obtained through public meetings held in both districts through Vital Corporation. Turn our attention to crime reports on Friday, August 8 at 2.13 p.m. Police say Sean Stradiron, 38, of Estate 22, was arrested and charged with third-degree burglary and unauthorized possession of a firearm in connection with an incident that occurred on Tuesday, August 4th. Stradiron was positively identified by the victim as the male who removed several items from his business after hours on the date of Tuesday, August 4th. The victim also identified Sean Stradiron as the male that struck him with a bear bottle to his head on that same morning, causing a laceration to the left side of his face, which required, required four sutures to close. Bail was set at $75,000. On Sunday, August 9th at 4.35 a.m., police were dispatched to the JFK housing community to investigate the report of a robbery and carjacking. Officers say they met with four women who had been victims, one of which had been gun butted to the head and declined medical attention. They said they were sitting down together outside on a sidewalk at JFK at roughly 4.10 a.m. After having attended a function at a local club, they were approached by two masked men with guns from behind who ordered them to the ground, searched them, took their gold chains, mobile phones, cash, and the car key of one of the women, then drove off in the vehicle, a gray-colored 2014 Toyota Corolla bearing dealer plates. Also, a weekend shooting incident is currently under investigation by detectives with the Criminal Investigation Unit. Police say on Sunday, August 9th at roughly 10 p.m., the 911 Emergency Call Center received notification from a concerned citizen who said they saw a woman covered with blood 
on the Halbe Roadway. Officers were dispatched to the scene where they discovered the wounded woman who would sustained an injury from an apparent gunshot to the face. An ambulance was called and she was rushed to the Schneider Hospital where she underwent emergency surgery. The age and name of the victim have yet to be determined as detectives are investigating the incident. Be sure to call police if you have any information that can assist in any one of these investigations. We'll turn our attention stateside. St. Louis County Executive Steve Stenger declared a state of emergency today after Ferguson protests on the anniversary of the fatal shooting of Michael Brown by a police officer turned violent overnight. Police say in St. Louis on Monday they arrested 56 people during protests outside the Thomas Eagleton Courthouse. The demonstrations were part of events dubbed Moral Monday. Overnight in Ferguson, at least three people were shot and four arrested as peaceful Sunday protests became violent. Keeping our eye on the economy, here's the New York Stock Exchange with our Stock Market Watch. As noted there, the Dow, Nasdaq, S&P all up. The Dow, 241, Nasdaq, 58, S&P, 500, 26. Coming up on News 2, an update on the sargassum cleanup performed recently on the East End. Was that the cause of the odor problem many complained about? Coming up next. Welcome back. The Office of Collective Bargaining's chief negotiator is stepping down. Governor Kenneth Mapp announced Friday that Dr. Valdemar Hill Jr. is retiring at the end of this month. Dr. Hill served as Collective Bargaining's exclusive representative in labor relations since 2009. Hill told Governor Mapp in his letter that he thoroughly enjoyed working in the position. Mr. Mapp in turn thanked Hill for his efforts and wished Hill all the best on his retirement. Grove Place Weed and Seed, along with the VIPD, they're hosting a day of family kite flying, part of the National Night Out Initiative. That's on Saturday, August 22nd at UVI's St. Croix campus from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. The event is geared towards students ranging in age from 3 to 13 and their parents. There'll be free kites for participants, a barbecue, school supplies and giveaways. So they hope to register in advance 150 participants for the event. The National Association of Town Watch is the nation's premier nonprofit crime prevention organization. Contact police officer Edith Christopher at 340-773-6393. The Community and Police Association, CAPA, in conjunction with the Red Hook Community Alliance, is conducting a town hall meeting for residents and commercial establishments of Red Hook, Nada, and Friedenhoy. And that began at 6 p.m. this evening at the Paradise Cove Resort, featuring reps from the VIPD. It's an opportunity to voice concerns, opinions, and viable solutions garnered during last week's meeting. CAPA has been working su successfully with several community-based organizations, such as the Savan-based group CAN and the Smith Bay Community Action Foundation addressing concerns such as the street naming project in Smith Bay as part of the geographic information system. Residents of Red Hook could feel some relief soon after the Department of Planning and Natural Resources efforts to identify the origin of a smell that's been plaguing the area. After doing some surveys and taking water samples, the department confirmed what many suspected for a long time. News News April Knight has that story. Sargassum, this brown seaweed that can grow up to four meters long, is invading the Caribbean. And residents here in the Red Hook area are definitely feeling the effect, or more accurately, smelling it. For months, a rotting smell has been plaguing residents and business owners in the area, prompting DPNR to do surveys to identify its origin. According to DPNR Commissioner Don Henry, while it may not be the only factor, the rotting sargassum is a major reason for the stench. As it decomposes, it gives off um, sulfide. It gives off that gas, oxygen sulfide. That is the odor 
Uh, Living sargassum is actually home and shelter to various marine species, and neighboring BVI has lauded its ecological benefits. But Commissioner Henry said that local survey showed that the rotting seaweed clogging up the shorelines has a negative effect on fish and wildlife. One of the readings that we got back, and that is from ETNR, the dissolved oxygen in the in the area is. It's the low water quality standard, it's the low water marine life need to be able to survive. Now, even after the DPNR cleanup, there is still a stench here in Red Hook and within smelling distance of Ivana Eudora Ken High School here behind me. Now, DPNR says they want to do another cleanup, possibly further out into the water, and they want to do it before the school year kicks in. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. Now, the department did stress that there might be other factors contributing to the odor. News 2 will keep you updated on further cleanups efforts by DPNR. Well, according to DPNR's weekly water quality analysis conducted during the week of August 3rd to the 7th, Water Bay on St. Thomas was deemed unsafe for swimming over the weekend. However, they say some beaches on St. Croix could not be sampled because of the heavy presence of seaweed along the shoreline. These beaches include Grape Tree Bay, Columbus Landing, Pelican Cove, Comrant, and Princess, the condo row. The Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands, CFVI, held their 2015 Scholarship Award reception on St. Thomas on Thursday, August 6th at My Brother's Workshop Cafe in Bakery Square. D. Basha Brown, president of CFVI, welcomed the recipients and their parents, scholarship donors, and the scholarship committee members. George H.T. Dudley, chairman, announced the award of 54 scholarships to Virgin Island students for a total of $88,735. CVI has awarded scholarships to Virgin Island students since 1996. Be sure to stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next. <music>